just on the brain damage front, there is real brain damage. The suicide rate among founders is significantly higher than the average in the population. And the, the depression rates are higher too. So actually being a founder is really bad for your head. Welcome to Aperture, a podcast where we highlight the people who are thinking and doing things differently. Our goal is to expose new ideas, to challenge received wisdom, and to open up debate. We cover strategy, technology, business models, and much more. If you like the podcast, please subscribe and also check out our other content at aperturehub.co. Thank you for listening. Welcome to episode three of Aperture. For this podcast, we are with Mike Nolle. Mike is best known as the CTO and co-founder of AppNexus, which is a real-time advertising platform which handles millions of ads per second and was recently sold to AT&T for almost $2 billion. Less well-known is what Mike is doing now, which is a startup called Live Better, aimed at improving people's mental health. We hope you enjoy. Thanks. Mike, welcome to Aperture, episode three. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So I have to tell you, I've been really looking forward to this discussion. Clearly, one of the things we want to talk about is your experience at AppNexus, how you were able to make that company so successful, some of the lessons learned. But I also want to um, explore the sort of darker side of tech with you. So for anybody who follows Mike on Twitter or reads him on Medium, you, you talk a lot about the excesses of, you know, of tech and the, and the sort of valley mindset. And so we want to get into some of those things too. And then, and then lastly, uh, we want to talk about your newest venture, Live Better, and you know, what that's all about. And also some of the change in perspective you've had that led you to start that company and also um, subsequent to starting that company. So let's kick off. Mike, um, just tell us about, about your journey so far, in particular, you know, the, net, the App Nexus story. I, my journey, where do we start? I guess we have to start... Uh, where did you grow up? I'm Dutch, born in, born in Holland. So I didn't know that. Yeah, they, yeah, I was born in Holland. I moved to the US when I was nine. And wow. I lived in France for a while, yeah. So, so I, what I, is I, your first language? My first language is Dutch, but my English is now, even my French is better than my Dutch now. Um, but yeah, I moved to the U.S., and I guess the story maybe starts around university, which is, went to a good school, and all the on-campus interviews were for things like McKinsey and Goldman and Google at the time already, 2004, and I couldn't get a good job. And so I ended up, my first job was working at a rather crappy consulting company. Its name at the time... What, what, did, what did you study? I studied economics. Okay. Economics, but I was always a geek. Actually, I did I did very little school and mostly programming uh, on the side because that made money. And then uh, I started working for a company called Answer Think, which is you know was probably a sign in the name that it was not the right place to go because normally you think and then you answer. But yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I got introduced to corporate life and hated it completely. Um, and then kind of almost by accident, ended up meeting Brian O'Kelly, who was ultimately my co-founder at AppNexus, uh, because he was a CTO. And I said, I want to be a CTO one day. And I said, can I take you out to lunch? He said, well, no, I'm too busy, but you can come interview at my startup, which was at the time Right Media, which was one of the first online, if not the first online ad exchange, a place to kind of buy, sell ads. So worked there for two years, got hooked on the startup thing. And then in 2007, Brian said, do you want to start a company together? And I said, absolutely, let's go. Um, so that was back in 2007. So we started the company. We didn't actually originally have an idea of what we we're going to do. Uh, we obviously had experience in advertising. And, uh, and so that's where we started. Uh, we started with actually first cloud computing. This was back when AWS was first starting. We thought okay. it would be the cloud ad platform for ads. And then over kind of several years of iterating and failing, that evolved into what it ended up being acquired as, which is you know a real-time advertising marketplace. Okay, in my mind, the, the sort of world of online ad marketplaces is there's you know Google and Facebook do it for themselves, right? Pretty much every everybody else uses AppNexus. Is that is that fair to say? 
So the so on, on the two ends you have the buyers and sellers, and in the middle you have a load of intermediaries because there's a few large sellers, YouTube, Facebook, and then of course there's millions of websites out there. Yep. And you know, no, all of them are too small to have their own sales force, and that are selling their media in some shape or form. Um, back in the day when when we started AppNexus, that was mostly through ad networks. Um, that has then evolved, and so now you have this kind of complex chain where uh, publishers they work with supply side platforms, which are fancy um, fancy words really for ad networks. People aggregate a number of sites and try to sell it. Um, you have uh, advertisers they they don't can't work with thousands of sellers, so they end up working with buy side platforms today called demand side platforms also basically ad networks in a way, in that the sense that they aggregate a serious amount of demand and supply with some uh, specialty uh, and put that out there. Uh, what AppNex has built was a platform to let anyone run a trading business. Okay. Um, and so that could be a load of ad networks would do this, and of course some very large buyers or very large sellers as well. Okay. And then Google, of course. So it's sort of like providing the infrastructure for the whole yeah. business rather than being a marketplace per se. Exactly. So okay. it's, it's a lot of the plumbing. And so Google, they have their own market. So they're a big seller with YouTube. They're, of course, they also run one of the biggest marketplaces through the DoubleClick ad exchange. Yeah. Um, and, of course, they also have advertising services. And they actually act as one of the biggest buyers as well because they advertise a lot of what they do. So Google just does everything. Is yeah. It's the simple answer. And how, um, like, back, like when you were working there, w what kind of volumes was Amnexus doing? It was huge, right? It was yeah, I mean, the, the volume of ads, effectively, because we we're infrastructure for, for the ecosystem. Well, back in when we started, and we started this model, um, we saw that advertising was very inefficient. And namely that because there were so many intermediaries, and both the, the end buyer and seller were often rather... Uh, naive or ignorant of what was actually happening, there was just tons of arbitrage and tons of, of, of people taking exorbitant fees yep. for really not yep. doing much work. And so uh, our idea was if we can do a real-time auction, then we can create an efficient marketplace. Think high-frequency trading. You know, can we, when someone goes to a web page, can we just say, hey, here's Ben, he's uh, in Geneva, and he likes uh, skiing, who wants to show him an ad? Um, and then can we in real time, so in real time here really mean in less than a hundred milliseconds, can we run, so a tenth of a second, can we run an auction and try to sell a, an opportunity to show Ben an ad? And our idea was that if we do that, then we can build a marketplace that brings efficiency and makes it a win-win for everybody. So the idea being um, that publishers could make more money, advertisers could have less fees, and of course we could build a successful business kind of selling this technology. So it was clearly very successful. And I just just to give a, like a sense of the scale at which you were ah, operating, scale, yeah. yeah. Because I just remember reading, I think it was on Wikipedia, so when I was preparing for this, there's some statistic on there about how many ads you're auctioning per minute or per second, and oh, it was phenomenal, second. right? Yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah, so, so as this company scaled and became quite successful, we ended up effectively listening to almost the entire internet. Yeah. Uh, because almost most ads on the internet these days are now sold in real time. Um, when I left, we were doing several million ads every single second, and that must now be maybe 10 or 20. Um, and what, what's actually quite crazy is that each one of those would syndicate out to up to 50 different technology platforms, each of which was representing hundreds of buyers. So you, you, we had millions of ads going out, turning into you know 50 million plus bid requests per second, which is more volume than the New York Stock Exchange does. So in terms of volume, the numbers were, were really quite ridiculous. Wow. Uh, and th that, was, that was the part that was really fun, was actually building the infrastructure to do that. So you know, we had thousands of servers all around the world dealing with you know, petabytes of data. And was that one of the hardest challenges in growing the company was scaling the tech? Oh, absolutely. If, if, if you look at, I mean, there were, there were market challenges, but I think the biggest for, for back, especially this is, you have to remember this is before AWS. Yeah. So we, we tried AWS back in 2008 for just as an, an experiment to see if you could run an ad platform. And back then, if you tried to throw more than let's say 10 or 20,000 um, page views per second, uh, the load balancers would stop working. So, so you couldn't actually run an ad business on Amazon. So we actually had to go out and get physical data center space and get bandwidth contracts and, and install the service. And even today, I mean, Amazon has gotten much better over the, and it's been you know 15 years later now, um, and they've come, become much better, but you, you had to build the technical expertise of building internet scale infrastructure. 
Yeah. Uh, and that requires one, uh, just a ton of capital because, you know, if you want to install a thousand servers, you know, just buying the servers is going to cost you $5 million. And so then, so are, these, are these challenges, you're saying these challenges that you faced because you were kind of pre-AWS and not the same challenges you would face today if you were to start the same business? It's significantly easier today, but it's still challenging. And right. if you still, you still many companies struggle to deal with the volumes of not just traffic, but then also the data that that spits off. Yeah. Um, because if you're buying billions of ads, that's just a load of data and, and getting some insight and analysis out of that uh, is, is incredibly difficult. So it's, it's become, let's say 10 X easier, but it's still really difficult. Yeah. And what were the other challenges? So I guess you had the usual challenges of, scaling the tech, finding the team, uh, anything else that, you know, anything that was sort of peculiar or particular to, to AppNexus? Well, I think what's interesting is now, I, I'm now obviously, fi it's five years since I've left the company. Um, so I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of startups about their challenges. And so what, what's interesting is I think 90% of the challenges we faced are challenges that everyone faces scaling yep. a company. You know, when we got to about 100 people, we started having problems around morale because, you know, it turns out when you, when you start a company and you're five people, it's, it's like a close family. And then you start growing, you're 25 people. And it's kind of like, you have a few houses on the street and your neighbors and everyone knows each other super well. Yeah. And then suddenly you get, there's this point you hit where suddenly people treat you like coworkers, not like family. And then suddenly you have to, you realize you don't have an HR function and oh crap, you've never done a compensation document. You've never, you know, put in rules, you know, operating rules, like how, how should we behave in a company? Um, so hundreds probably about the point at which you can't know everybody personally either, right? Yeah. There's some number of magic number. Yeah. We found it was when we hit around a hundred people that we started having some real organizational scale challenges and, and no one had any real management experience, yeah. right? So uh, so a lot of the problems we faced are, are ones that everyone faces, I think, as they grow. Um, and especially, I think we really had this hyper growth story because we went, you know, we went, we basically doubled our staff every year for six years in running. So we went 50, 100, 200, 400, 800. Uh, and so that there comes, there's a unique set, unique set of challenges when you, one, don't have any management experience. Like yeah. the largest team I'd managed before I started the company was four people. And suddenly, you know, when you have 200 people in an organization, like, well, how do you do that? Well, it turns out there's a lot of people who know how to do it, but startup founders tend to not know how to do it. Yeah. Um, so we had a lot of those challenges. And then I think that the... And how, how did you overcome... Sorry, come, come back to the other challenge. But how did you overcome that? Was it the kind of advice and expertise that was brought by the board, the investors that helped you to overcome that? Was it hiring, you know, experienced managers? And, and then how did you do all that without fundamentally sort of undermining the culture and of app nexus that's a big question so so i think then missing from that how do you do that without fundamentally undermining your own physical well-being yeah is another one and that one i failed at miserably which is <laughs> but i think what's interesting is the biggest breakthrough for me growing the company was i mean i i used to have quite a big ego i probably started the company because i had a chip on my shoulder and i had something i wanted to prove i don't know to who but i definitely felt like I had to prove something to somebody. And I think the transformational point for me was when I realized that I, I just had no fucking clue what, what I was doing. Um, we'd gotten to a scale where I just, I was completely under underwater. I, I didn't know how to, you know, the tech team at the time were something like 50 people were dealing with internet scale, technical challenges. I don't have a computer science degree. Um, we're, you know, we're dealing with all sorts of kind of people issues and scaling issues and comp issues and, and management issues. And one day I realized I just didn't know what to do. Um, and I actually, for me, the saving grace was a, a club in New York. There's a, a club, it's called the New York CTO club. Uh, and I ended up getting introduced to, um, one of the guys who runs it. And he said, well, come to a meeting and meet some others. And, it, and it, I just met and they, and it's a great club because you have, you have startup CTOs of 10 person companies and you have CTOs of, you know, you have major engineering leaders from Google who are, are in the club or in big banks. And then talking to these other CTOs, I realized that I didn't have to solve these problems alone, that yeah. most of them were ones that people have solved before. And I just found some amazing advisors and mentors uh, in that group that then enabled me to hire new people because what, what the investors would say just hire a vpe yeah. hire you know hire a head of infrastructure hire 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 but actually you can't hire those people unless they respect you and i think because i was a young cocky 
uh, startup founder thinking I was amazing, a lot of people met me and said, well, you know, I, I couldn't convince them to come work for the company. And it's when I learned some humility that I just had no clue what I was doing and just switched from, hey, we're great and amazing to like, hey, you know, we're, we're on this great growth path, but you know, I re honestly, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm looking for a seasoned engineering leader. That's when we started having the breakthrough and, and these people would come on board and we're like, yeah, I, I do want to help you. I, I do know how to solve those problems. And I, I learned that I had a unique ability to solve some of the ad tech challenges. There's some kind of market mechanics that make, that make building a tech company for advertising quite unique. Um, and I just found the right people to come on board who could deal with, you know, issues like how do you build five data centers around the world? Well, I found a guy, Tim Smith, he just, he'd done it before and he did it again. Um, yeah. The, I mean, these are the benefits of clusters, right? Which is, you know, um, you'd find it, I think you'd find it very difficult if you were to do this from, from here, you know, Geneva, Switzerland to, to find that same CTO club and those same mentors and yeah. advisors, right? Although funny story, when we went out to raise money on Sand Hill road back in 2007, uh, Brian, my co-founder, he did most of the fundraising and many VCs, we, we've got several VCs who told us, we'll fund you if you move to San Francisco. Right. So back at, back then in 2007, people said New York is not a place to run a startup. And, you know, imagine someone saying that now, New York is one of the, you know, yeah. probably number two in the U S I think, I think last year they became number two in terms of funding. So obviously, you know, you have to go through some growing pains, but I think here in Switzerland, you know, there haven't been many exits. There haven't many people who've been there and done that before. So it certainly is more difficult. I think for founders here just to get some, you know, some advice from people who've done it because it really, I, I think 90% of the startups problems are just recurring problems that everyone faces as they build companies. Just to, do, and do you think your your evolution? So to ask you a personal question, but I reckon you're game for this anyway. But that evolution that in in your own sort of psyche from being you know the cocky, um, um, I mean these are your words, right? The, the, yeah. um, to the sort of more humble, um, uh, you know, more experienced, more humble uh, founder. Like, do you think the same Mike Nolle who became more humble would have been the same Mike Nolle to have taken such an ambitious step to create the company in the first place? Like, isn't isn't this, this sort of bravado, the cockiness, part of what it takes to create something with this, you know, with the same ambition that you had for AppNexus or not? I don't think I could do it again. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I have the right mindset. And it's not just me. I think it's the whole team. If I think of the, the founding team of the company, um, we were, there was probably a core set of about 20 of us. And 19 out of 20 of us had no kids. Some yeah. were married. Most, many were single. Uh, there's one guy on our engineering team, Urson, who, who ran data, who had a wife and a kid. I don't, I don't know how he survived. He, he stayed with, the, I think he's still there actually, but uh, he, he, I mean, he was a rock star because now I have a four year old. Now I have no idea how anyone wants the baby does a startup because yeah. geez, I mean, the startup in itself is hard enough. And so I think there's part of like getting a group of young people and we would work together all week and then we would go out together on the weekend very often. So there was this total mix of a total immersion. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so we're all immersed in, in New York and the city that never sleeps always on, we would go on ski trips together. So there was this, this environment that helped us create, I think an amazing product and an amazing company that was totally ageist because if you were not yep. young and willing to go out, you know, the people who didn't go out on Saturday night would come into work on Monday and be like, well, what happened over the weekend? Because there was always progress. I was in the office every Sunday and now I, I can't even imagine working on a weekend. I need my weekend. I need family time. Um, so I think there's something inherently, yeah, I guess ageist, you know, I, I don't think it's sexist necessarily, but there's also, we were predominantly male, so that's another topic maybe, but that, that means that I think a lot of these startups come from groups of young people because they can just dedicate their life to it in a way yeah. that if you have a family, you can't. Yeah. And I suppose the, there's a sort of fearlessness of ignorance in a way as well, right? Which. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Exactly. Just this idea. Yeah, I can do this. Of course I can. Where if realistically you look at the statistics and the odds I mean, this, yeah. the statistics are pretty pretty bad. I mean, we talked about this uh, last time we saw. My, I have this analogy for, for startups that it's, it's kind of like the NFL. If, the, if you look at the NFL, the salaries in the NFL are actually not that high for the vast majority of players. I mean, it's far above you know, the median U.S. wage, but it's not, you know, you only play for a few years. The physical damage is, is really high. Yep. And now it turns out a lot of people end up with serious brain damage as well. 
And there's a few star players who make millions of dollars that everyone celebrates. And I think startups are exactly the same. You know, the vast majority of people don't make money. A vast majority of people probably work. If you look at the hourly wage of most startups, people, even the ones getting salaries is far below market yeah, yeah, yeah. and a few people make it. And I think you kind of have to be young and stupid to, 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 to do that in a way. Um, and if you get lucky, you can, you know, make it and, and get your millions of dollars and the vast majority of people end up just not making it, which is the, the sad truth. Do you think the whole promise of startups is in a way like missold or oversold? Given the odds and given some, you know, the scars that you, you, you get if you, if you, you know, if you, it's like if you're in a successful startup, clearly um, you can make a lot of money, but it also comes with a lot of sacrifices. And people tell you, if you want to change the world, the way to change the world today is to do a startup, right? Yeah. Do you, do you subscribe to that, to that view or do you think it's kind of oversold? I think it works sometimes. Just on the brain damage front, there is real brain damage. The suicide rate among founders is significantly higher than the average in the population. And the, the depression rates are higher too. So actually being a founder is really bad for your head. But let's talk about like the promise of the startup. So I think the, f the first thing to realize that, and I read this, I, I got to find the article and I'll send it to you so you can put it on, on, on the blog post that goes with this. But it talked about that actually, if you look at the economics of startups, ultimately um, the people who are making the money are the LPs and the VC funds and the VCs. The VCs get their carry uh, and they're basically, VCs are guaranteed not to make a loss. Whereas often startup founders invest their life savings. Yep. They, they can really lose their money. So the people making money ultimately is the elite out of these startups. And you know, there's the top, whatever, I don't know if it's 1% or 5% of startups that end up getting a financial return that then join that elite. So there's, there's this yep. economic model that I think is worth questioning uh, about whether it's the right one. And I think it's very interesting for Switzerland in particular because I think it's very un-Swiss to do that model. It's a lot of people taking below market wages at a tiny probability of making it rich. Yep. And the people who are making the guaranteed money are the elite as part of that. So I think for, for founders already it's questionable. For the employees, it's certainly not because if you look at, I, I've now been part of two exits. So one was right media, the first startup I worked at, I made no money on the exit. I worked like a dog for below market salary. I made no money. The second was a founder. Obviously I did better, better off that time. But the reality is, is that startups are pyramid schemes in of themselves. So I think for founders and employees, I think you really want to question that model. Yeah. I think a lot of engineers now are waking up to it. I think in Silicon Valley, engineers now demand significant, very high salaries and they're right to do so because many of them have been through a startup, have seen and didn't make any money. And are saying, okay, well, you got to pay me a quarter million dollars a year to work for you because I don't believe your equity is worth anything. And I think that's a really safe attitude for anyone taking a job at a startup. The second aspect is from a societal impact. Is the startup the right vehicle to change some of society's problems? Yeah. And so I think there's a problem, let's take for example, obesity. So where the food we're eating right now is bad. So capitalism got us here, right? So thank you Nestle for making lots of sugar loaded products that are really bad for us. So I think the startup model for food is very interesting. Because we have an existing ecosystem where we go out, we buy food, we eat it, and then, oh, we have no more food in our pantry, so we go out and we buy more. And I think there's new startups coming out that are creating new products that are healthier, that have better supply chain management, that know where the underlying goods come from, that are doing it in a sustainable way. And I think for that, the startup ecosystem of raise capital, build a, you know, release, develop a new product, and release it to the market is fantastic. Um, I think there's other areas where it's quite the opposite. So we'll get to this probably more later, but with, you know, I've been working in mental health now for four years and mental health is an area where startup economics just simply don't work. Yep. And, and yeah. I think actually I would expand it to healthcare as a whole. I was at a conference a few weeks ago in London. I was talking about digital health and the entire 98% uh, of the content in the conference was how do we treat people who are sick? And I, I find that just, deeply wrong because we now have more people dying from preventable lifestyle driven diseases yep. than any time than from non-preventable ones. Right. And so like, instead of talking about how do we treat people with heart conditions or with diabetes, we should talk about how do we prevent people from getting diabetes? And there is no economic model for that. And that is where startups don't work. Yep. Because if you're going to start a startup in healthcare, guess what? How do you make money? When the insurance company reimburses you. When does the insurance company reimburse you? When someone is diagnosed as sick. 
So we got to break that cycle somehow and startups are not the way to do that. Yeah. Oh, there's so much to explore there. I mean, there's some there's other opportunity costs as well, right? Which is if, if you tell every, if you tell every smart kid coming out of college, they should do a startup. There must be all sorts of opportunity costs in terms of them not doing other things that are of massive societal value. Yeah. Like politics or civic engagement. There's, you know, government, public service are, are also, you know, if you think about Switzerland, you know, the vast majority of people get healthcare, it's private companies, but you know, you, you still need people who, who want to work for insurance companies. Like some, someone's yeah. got to do that work too, which is incredibly valuable for society. We shouldn't just, yeah, there's this, and this teachers hero. and doctors. And, yeah, yeah. This hero celebration, like actually the heroes are not saving the world. Um, in the, in this book that we're talking about, the causes of, of happiness, um, the impact that your primary school and your primary school teacher has on you um, are felt in your happiness for the rest of your life. You know, So, I mean, I don't think we accord the right level of importance to things like teaching. Right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But anyway, I think that, that is potentially a rabbit hole. So we'll just, we'll just stick like that for a second because what we really want to get you on is business models because um, I think what you're alluding to is, is startup business models are a problem, right? And I think maybe let's start with the whole ad-driven business model right because app nexus um if you go on the website has a very noble sounding mission right which is to i'm not sure i've got this right but to power the ad-based business model that powers the internet something to that effect right let's see it powers the advertising that powers the internet yep the mission is to create a better internet and for us that begins with advertising is an advertising based internet a good thing i mean because presumably when you did it when you started the company you thought it was do you, do you still think that's the case? Parts of it, yes. So I, I think there's a challenge, which is that or the economics of content have basically been driven down to zero. Um, I think the problems of advertising come in when we get to things like news, where news is an important social good. Like It's very important that we are informed about the news. And before you used to get a newspaper uh, subscription, you would pay by quarter, by year, and you would get you know, your newspaper. My dad was the New York Times. And you would get the New York Times once a day delivered to your doorstep, and that's how you got your news. And they had news editors and journalists who, who made most of the decisions of what went into the newspaper. If you look at news today, most major newspapers update the news in real time based on clicks and that's a problem and the reason so the reason they do this is clicks drive page views so that you want the most clicks so the more clicks you get on google news for your articles the more ads you show and the more money you make and now newspaper editors whose job used to be to curate and decide what was important right are now also making decisions about not just what's important but what's driving page views and that's problematic because clicks are not driven by our rational brain. I rationally know that I'm happiest when I read The Economist once a week because The Economist gives me a really nice summary of the news. It's not sensationalist. They give a deep analysis. I feel smarter when I read it and I'm up to date. Yet the animal part of my brain, when I've got five minutes, takes up my phone, opens up Google News and clicks on Donald Trump just tweeted whatever. Yep. And when, then once you've done that, you're then in a loop, right? Where and then I, all yeah, these then things are, you know, 20 minutes go by. Exactly, I waste yeah. 20 minute minutes of my life reading news that I, is actually I, a not important. I, I wish an editor had cut that and told me that I shouldn't read that because it's a waste of my time. Um, so I'm spending time on stuff that's not important, but the newspapers are making money because it's an advertising model. So I think that we have to really, there's, there's times when advertising works great. You know, if you're a, a YouTube blogger, You've got a YouTube stream and advertisers are, I want to promote their products there. If it's transparent, clear, I'm all game for this. And, but I think there's some areas where for social goods, we really need to consider whether or not this is the right way to do it. And I think it's leading to this, you know, the New York times, I feel has become more and more left-wing sensationalist. Yeah. Fox news has become more and more right-wing sensationalist. We have all these clickbaity headlines and we're no longer having an informed discussion about these topics. It's almost like, which side are you on left or right? Like this Trump, what happened? Where's the middle ground? Can we, can we have a discussion about, you know, and how do you, how do you, and how do you, do you think you dial the back the dial on, on sensationalism how, how do we go back i mean the genie is out of the box right how do you how do you go back to a pre-internet level of 
you know, of considered rational debate? I have no idea. Okay, I don't either. So. I, I hope someone. <laughs> I hope someone has an idea. Yeah. Well, ultimately. But I mean, you, what about what about the you know the, the you you mentioned the Economist. The Economist works on the basis that it it's out once a week. You pay a subscription. The subscription means that they can fund journalism, investigative journalism. I mean, it seems like subscriptions could be part of the answer. Um, it seems like micropayments could be part of the answer. But I think the reason I said the genie's out of the box is because if you say to people, okay, we're going to now, this, this product's now got a price tag, um, then people get up, you know, people get up in arms quite quickly because they're so used to consuming content for free that they're, you know, it's, I'm not sure how you get people to pay again. I'm not sure how you kind of wind back the clock on this. Yeah, so may, maybe ultimately it comes back down to government taking a role and and funding, whether it is a series of independent, well, uh, funding and regulation. So if people aren't willing to pay for it, uh, let's let's fund it with some kind of shared tax or some at least some yep. factual, non sensational basis of of news, where where we're not you know constantly pulled down the rabbit hole. So I think there's a there's a ca- there's a case for government intervention in in a way because if if the internet has got rid of distribution costs then things become abundant and the na- the very nature of a public good is one that's abundant and like non-rival so like it doesn't diminish in quality if multiple people consume it which is twitter right the problem with twitter is that it's funded by ads therefore you know it because you know it's it has an incentive to keep you on there for longer and therefore it has an incentive to promote more and more stuff to you that you think they think that you want to read well, and therefore and worse is that anybody can pr- can promote any point of view yep. non transparently so on facebook you know, you can take a post you write a nice sensational headline so you get some amplified sharing and then you promote it and the question is who is promoting it now kudos to facebook they just started doing this in canada i believe where you have to have show your id so at least they know who is promoting political views but everything else anybody i can create a facebook account and in 10 minutes be running ads that promote my point of view and i can target it in a hyper specific way Right. And, and, and that's just wrong. Like, like at some yep. point, yeah, sure. If you're Coca-Cola and you want to sell more Coke, great. That, that makes sense. But at some point when we get to information or let's talk about truth, something, something has to happen here. Um, now we're in this post truth world, you know? So there might be a case for providing public goods, um, or go- the, the government providing public goods. I think the other advantage of government and this, I think gets us, in, into more what you're doing now, which is when it's a merit good, because as you said earlier on, you know, w- when it's, there's so much, there's so many merit goods that aren't provided adequately or in, an, in, in enough supply because there's not an easy monetization route. And you, I mean, you, maybe we'll come back to this in a second, but a classic example is, you know, is, is preventative mes- medicine that you mentioned, right? Yeah. Um, so I guess the question is that, you know, it seems like since about the 1980s, we've had this narrative that government is bad. Um, all the innovation comes out of the private sector. Therefore, you know, again, is how easy is it to roll back the clock on that and to say to people, actually, the government has a very important role, after all, in the provision of public goods, even things that people really wouldn't think the government should be doing. Like, you know, imagine if you said t- Twitter is now going to be a public good um, going to be taken over by this state i mean and then what how does that work across national boundaries i mean it's a problematic well, issue isn't let's, it let's maybe step away from kind of the abstract because yeah. honestly i'm not i'm not qualified to talk about it and, and move into kind of but you've thought about it a lot right i, I thought about it but let, let, let's talk about more concrete things like public goods like mental health and just to, to shift there um because maybe context i i started four years ago a little better as you know um, yeah when you moved to switzerland when I moved to Switzerland, exactly, and and the original my the mission of the company is to help people boost their well being. So uh, we were for profit. The idea was to take a startup model, and iterate on a tech product, and can we use technology at scale to help people be happier? And can we make money doing it? This kind of what Anand calls in his book, "Winner Takes All," this magic win win situation. Yep. Um, and fast forward four years, we found out that yes, we can build technology that helps people be happier. You can download the Live Better app. When people do it, we have a research study in progress, but you clearly see that people do basically many sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy or, or well-being or mindfulness, and it helps them. 
The problem is it doesn't make money because people aren't willing to pay for apps because the app economy is going down to zero. Um, so context that for where I want to move this, which is if you look at the UK, is shifting the model a little bit. And it's rare that you say the NHS is, is a model to look for, but the NHS, because they're a single payer healthcare system, uh, has figured out that people who have mental health problems cost them a lot of money later in life. Yep. And whereas in the US, there is no economic model because if an insurance company does a lot of prevention, they're more expensive, which means they do it for a year and then someone switches to another insurance company who has the benefit from that. Yeah. In the UK, the NHS has said, hold on, people aren't sleeping enough and not sleeping enough is tied to all sorts of bad health outcomes. And so you now in the UK can get Sleepio prescribed by your GP and the NHS will pay for it. And I think that's a wonderful case of government and private working together. So I think the government has to kind of tweak the economic conditions so that individual entrepreneurs, you can call them social entrepreneurs or whatever that is, have a framework whereby they can then compete with each other to find the best possible solution. But it has to be done within some framework, not this free for all, not you know, sidestepping regulation, but really kind of working with the system to develop the best possible preventative treatment or for that matter, also kind of normal treatment as well. Yeah, so, I suppose that's the flaw in what I was saying, right? Which is the, the um, there's nothing, if you, if you agree that certain goods should be provided free or even subsidized because they have a, you know, a very positive impact on society, that doesn't mean the government needs to provide them. The government just needs to, as you said, just to subsidize them or provide the framework for them to be provi provided free in the first place. Yeah, every person could get, you know, a $500 annual credit to spend on their personal well-being, yep. right? Which can then, for any company that meets some certification, i.e. it's research-based and it actually is proven to help, let people choose what they want to spend their money on, would be a really nice balance between and allowing entrepreneurs to be very innovative and iterative with their approach, which a government can't be, but also allocating money in a way so that you know people spend time on prevention, uh, which is just incredibly important. Uh, yeah, th th there's another point, which is that th there's government's kind of the only actor that can take into account externalities, right? Because if it's provided by the private sector, they're only interested in their own private costs and in and out income. Whereas a government can take a bigger view and take into account the positive and negative externalities of these things, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, and they have their vested interest of their citizens at heart, right? If you look at, uh, I was trying to avoid macro issues, but Uber, in a way, like so they've built amazing technology, but a huge part of their business is sidestepping regulation. That's how they became big. Yeah. Uh, and I think in the end, sidestepping regulation and then taking just a percentage of all taxi proceeds and funneling them to Silicon Valley and, and their investors. You know that it would. I think there's. I, I read. I, I see if I can find it. I forgot the city. There's some city. I think it was Austin. And they have now their own taxi app for the city of Austin, and it's paid for. It's a government-funded product. That actually feels like a, a, a decent way for a government to spend their time. So rather than having Uber, who pays you know substandard wages to people, I mean, still guaranteeing that taxi drivers are taken care of and have yeah. you know the right benefits and the right wages and the convenience of this technology. Yeah, I think that's, I, I agree. I think there's a massive role because I don't think you want to stop the innovation, right? That, that leads to better customer services or better, better consumer services. And which, you know, I mean, if you take the case of Uber, right? I mean, there's, there were whole parts of cities that weren't served by, by taxis because it was too expensive. You know, bringing the price point down, down to somewhere where everybody can take advantage of, of, of that, means of transport is a good thing. The problem is on, on the other side, which is you said, right, which is um, if it's just a case of, of lowering uh, wages for workers and pushing it into, into cheaper consumer goods, there's a problem, right? So I think the role of the government in terms of like allowing um, those, those workers the ability to bid up their own wages by helping them to port their benefits or to port their data from one provider to the other, I think that's a, like the whole kind of... Um, Tim O'Reilly idea of a, you know government as a platform I think is really interesting yeah. um, which again is like not directly providing consumers not in any way stopping innovation but just making sure that, that the safety net rises as as innovation takes place which I think is the whole backlash against technology I think is a large part about that right which is people as consumers benefit from these things and they and they you know day to day 
but as workers, they can see that it's putting pressure on their lifestyles and, and, and it's difficult to, squ without government intervention, and intervention is maybe the wrong word, but that government support and infrastructure, it's difficult to see how both you get uh, the innovation that leads to better consumer outcomes at the same time as you get but better. There was this amazing um, graphic in Our World in Data, which they do these great infographics, and it talked about the evolution of, of the price of various goods over the last, I can't remember if it was 40 or 50 years. And you know, if you look at things like a television, the cost has come down 90%. Yeah. And I think that's because of entrepreneurship and capitalism and, 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 and investors who, who invest in Sony and Panasonic and Samsung and all these companies that make cheaper displays and, and, and competition than capitalism. And at the same time, there's, there's a few things where this cost has skyrocketed, where dollar adjusted, kind of inflation adjusted, things are two or three times more expensive today than it used to be. And those are healthcare and education, these core fundamental goods. And, and those are the areas where I think startups are not gonna fix education. Startups are not gonna fix healthcare. And, and, and we need to all just wake up to that reality and find a better way. Yeah. Like when, and you know, it's not go back to, you know, it's not go back to communism or, you know, like in, in America, there's this whole negative dialogue around socialism, socialism is bad. Yeah. Like that, it's not that like it's capitalism versus socialism. It's just that capitalism is great for making a new iPhone and making an Apple watch and, and making amazing technical innovation. And capitalism just sucks when it comes to helping us be happier, more educated and, and healthier. And so let's find a model that can take the best of capitalism, but also invest more resources in what matters, which to your point earlier, ed making sure our children have great nurturing environments where they learn because, you know, it's like your happiness, your lifetime happiness is almost fixed, at least statistically, before you're 10 years old. Yeah. No, and I, I, I agree. I think there's, you know, the other point is that capitalism is has done amazing things in terms of lifting people out of poverty i think it's about making capitalism work better rather than you know t suggesting that capitalism is completely broken and needs to be replaced and one part of that would be environmental making capitalism run on renewable rails but another part of that is, is what we were talking about just before which is lifting um the safety net as people as societies get richer to ensure that you know everybody takes part everybody benefits from that improvement in living standards and then the third part which is which is um the bit you were talking about which is i think where we could maybe what we could talk about for a second which is how do you introduce more meaningful measures of progress because like you said you, you talked about prices of things and to my mind you know the whole way in which we measure inflation is broken because mm. if if we said there's no inflation but all the things that really matter to people, like the things that really determine your quality of life, like healthcare, education, are growing exponentially, then there's lots of inflation. Similarly, you know, if we only look at if we only look at GDP, but, but GDP isn't leading to, you know, people being happier, then again there's there might be a problem there. And I think the, the last point about happiness is one you know, we were talking about that earlier, which is I think quite close to your uh, heart, right? Where do we start? <laughs> <laughs> this is the good. <laughs> we, we, could, we could talk about this for a long time, um, but absolutely. I mean, it, you look at it just very simply. Like the U.S. is a great. I, I keep going back to the U.S. It's it's the country I know best. I mean, I've been here for four years. It's what's in the U.S. They have some of the highest kind of raw dollar numbers in terms of median income and, and things yeah. like that. But but I would say most people are, are 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 not that happy. I haven't seen the latest metrics but if you just go there people are stressed and working like dogs and, and a lot of that is the cultural value system have shifted towards celebrating hard work and it used to be back in england back in what i don't know when 1800s 1700s if you were wealthy you would not work that much yeah like the sign of, of of the upper class was having leisure time and we've had this flip where now suddenly everybody's just working hard and we're celebrating working hard and it's like, well, how are you? I'm busy is now the thing to say. Yeah, yeah. And I just hope it doesn't come to Switzerland because I feel like the Swiss have still respect for free time on the weekends uh, and, and, and things that actually, it's, even though maybe you make a little bit less money, taking more time is just so important uh, for your happiness. And, and there's a number of other, I mean, it's not the only thing to do, but there's so many metrics like that where, yeah, you could make more money or yeah, we could drive kind of, that cost or the, the you know the, how much this costs or how much uh, how much how much energy i spend on this but really it's about relationships spending time with people you care about eating well and having time to sleep like, like 
that's what we need to be promoting. Yeah. Even if we all make a little bit less uh, from a kind of a national GDP standpoint, like that would result in a happy society. I'm conscious that you haven't told us a great deal yet about li Live Better. So um, how does that work practically? So it's an app, people download it. How, how then does it work? How does it help them to improve their, their mental well-being? It's quite interesting. So the, we're talking about this decision-making. And when I first started Live Better, um, the theory was that you know, in advertising, we collected loads and loads of data, right? So what sites you visit, you build a profile, and then you can make recommendations through ads effectively. And I thought, can we do the exact same thing, but with positive behaviors? So can yep. we collect data about you through your smartphone, your smartwatch, your behavior, and then say, hey, you know, maybe you need to walk a little bit more. Maybe you need to sleep a little bit more. Maybe you should, you know, take a few deep breaths every now and then. Um, can we make recommendations? And I actually built a prototype. I tested it on myself and some friends and family. And I, I learned the first truth that every psychologist knows, which is that no one likes being told what to do. Yeah. And there's actually a school in psychology, it's called motivational interviewing. It's fascinating where actually if you want to get someone to do something, so let's say quit smoking, actually the worst thing to do is to say you should quit smoking. It's, it's incredibly counterintuitive, yep. right? Because that's normally when you see something, someone do something bad, you know, you should go to bed earlier. You should do this. You should, you know, stop eating chocolate. Actually, what you're doing is the opposite and you're making that behavior more likely. Um, but a much more effective thing would be to ask, hey, in the past, have you managed to stop smoking for a while? Which then gets the person to start thinking about that behavior in a time in the past when they maybe successfully changed it. So anyways, so Live Better, uh, th this, was, this is what we stumbled upon, was that uh, one, psychologists actually know how to change behavior. So if you go to therapy, a, a therapist can help you quit smoking, uh, give them some sessions. It's, it's going to be probably successful. Um, two, that actually the secrets to boosting our well-being are actually not secret. So, you know, if you read the news, you, you know, every week there's something, a new article, hey, you know, eating broccoli is, is will boost your mood, you know. Yeah. And so you have no idea what to do. You know, should I eat broccoli or should I sleep more, right? And it turns out if you look at the research, it's, it's, it's there, right? The things that make you happy are basically taking care of your body, so eating well, getting enough sleep and, and walking. You don't have to exercise. Just make sure you move a little bit. Don't stay seated all day. And then two, having strong relationships and spending time with people you care about. And so if you take care of your body and have strong interpersonal relationships, you've got a great foundation, bonus points for doing something that's valuable to you. It doesn't have to be changing the world. It can be, you know, it can be serving coffee at a cafe, but if you're proud of the coffee you're serving, it can be meaningful to you if you make someone's day with that. And so actually we started to live better, like rec making remediations was totally the wrong thing to do. And actually there's this whole world of knowledge out there that is very accessible, that's, that is not in the mainstream view, and that if people would just know, they would probably become happier. And so we developed an app, Live Better, uh, that is a digital life coach. Uh, we have two, they're, they're purely virtual, there's no real people behind them, Lee and Liam, and they try to coach you to be a little happier. And the way they do that is really sharing a little bit of this knowledge that we've learned through our research, and it's all research-based. And the other is by asking you every now and then some probing questions to get you to think about these things. Like, who are the people that are important to you? And you list those people, and then the following question might be, well, when's the last time you were in touch with these people? And we might stop there, but that's just enough to get your brain going. Be like, yep. oh, my mom matters to me. I haven't called her in a few weeks. I should call her. Yeah. Um, and so that's how it works. So you can just download and install the app uh, and, and get going uh, whenever you want. And you'll get a daily text message, a little question. And we try to keep it fun and light and totally accessible. Um, and you've seen um, reasonably good adoption of this, right? And you've also seen or you're able to at least demonstrate now that it's having a positive uh, impact on people's well-being, right? Yeah, well, we're, we're, our research study should be done at the end of this month to actually prove it. So we're doing our first research study, study with the University of Denver, and we're launching another one with, with Columbia in New York uh, later this year. But we see uh, everything, if you install the app, if you complete one of the challenges together with the coach, everything's based on, on, on research. And so, for example, Richard Lair talks about this a lot, too. In his book, you know, Gratitude is something that is yep. just... The, the research behind gratitude is tremendous. 
basically if you can make gratitude part of your daily toolkit um you will be happier like it just it has a it has a profound impact for the, on your for, life. the for the giver of gratitude as well as the receiver or it's it's a both, both and yeah. that's that's okay. the beauty of gratitude which is you know thank you for having me on this podcast this is fun and and i appreciate the time and energy you're putting into this you know Hopefully you feel a bit better. About I me. do. Thank you. I actually mean it. Yeah, I, you, actually, can't, you can't see because it's um, not recorded, but I'm glowing. Yeah, <laughs> Ben is glowing <laughs> a little bit. He is, he's got a big smile. Um, and, and so gratitude is this wonderful thing where now I feel better because I made you feel better. Yeah. And it, it's, it's about helping others. And so, you know, through the app, we get people to, to identify someone they could thank for something and then get them to write a text message and then send that. And so we know that has a positive impact. Um, what the research study will hopefully help us help us prove is that that turns then into a habit that you start doing on your own because you've done it a few times. You realize it makes you feel good. The coach explained to you why it works. Uh, and that's so I'm kind of anxiously, anxiously awaiting the results. We know we have at least a tiny boost and I'm, I'm quite optimistic that we see some profound change. Yeah. Uh, and we've had a few people write to us where we had some woman who reconnected with her high school best friend 20 years later and was getting on a plane to go visit her. And she wrote us a thank you note, which of course made us feel, made yeah. us feel really good because she found a great friend again. And that, I mean, going back to the research, you know, strong relationships, that's what's going to make you happy. So without the same seeming sort of too contrived, I mean, if we go back to some of those earlier discussions, what you're doing then is you're just bottom up, just nudging people towards living healthier, more meaningful lives, right? So it's not a top down change in narrative or, or what did you call them, the value system, or whatever, but it's a bottom yeah. up grassroots led improvement in people's lives. And which is, so first of all, I think it's probably having a way bigger impact than maybe you acknowledge. And then this, but the second thing is that you said that, you know, you can't, you can't get people to pay for this and nor should you, right? Because the minute you, well, in theory, right? Because the minute you put up a paywall, consumption will drop, you know, it's normal supply and demand. And therefore you'd be cutting people off from services that are beneficial to them. And I, I guess in some cases are life-saving to them. So the question then is, is Mike Nolley just funding this out of Mike Nolley's um, pocket? So is this, are you like a, a genuine philanthropist? Yeah, so, so what we found, exactly to your point, is that the, um, we, we did experience, we tried throwing up a paywall, yep. and we found just the, the lifetime value of a customer was far lower than the cost of acquisition because, because the app marketplace is just swamped with... The, and people don't, I guess people don't refer other people because they're embarrassed that they have... Mental yeah, so, so we yeah. tried social referral mechanisms. We found it, one, peop, one thing people really appreciate about the app is that it's anonymous and private. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you don't have to give us your email. You, you can use a fake name. You know, the coach just wants to be able to call you something. It can be Purple Koala. Like, we don't care. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so it's a totally private, anonymous experience, um, which is why people value it. And so we, and we asked people to share Live Better, and, and the response was like, no, I don't want people to Silence. use this. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, not yeah. even a no, just people ignore yeah. it. Because the, the thing is we have with our phones, if we don't want to deal with something, we just turn them off, Yeah. right? And, and that, that's the big challenge. And so what, what we decided in, this was this past December actually, we started looking, well, what do we do? Because the whole, whole idea was as a startup was to get revenue, which would give us money to do marketing, which let us, would lead us to have a bigger impact. And what everyone else seemed to be doing, and I've, I've talked to a number of other founders who've done mental health startups and investors, or it's really a trend now where everyone's now going corporate. So all the B2C apps are not making money. Yep. And so everyone's saying, well, let's, if, if we can prove through a research study that this is boosting well-being, well, the person who's going to pay for it will be the company. Because if we can reduce stress, the company benefits from a lower stressed workforce, and there we go. And but the problem then is, you're again, leaving the most needy outside of the Exactly. And, and we see the most engaged audience on Live Better is, is, is probably students yeah. who don't have a company who's going to pay, pay for this. And we have a few lonely, unemployed people who are at home all day. And, and so what I realized is that the logical economic capitalist thing to do would be to do that. Um, but we, the, the entire team, we just didn't, that's not what we wanted to do. We didn't want to abandon the customers we already had to go do this. And so I've, our, we have our 501c3 nonprofit application pending with the IRS. So we're actually converting Live Better to a nonprofit um, because we want to make decisions not based on what's the most profitable. That doesn't mean we might not sell some services and try to make some money yeah. 
because raising money from foundations I'm discovering is very painful. Um, if any foundations are interested, please call me. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, so raising money is difficult. So we do want to get some revenue streams, but we want to make our priority is really to boost well-being. That that's what we're in this for, and so we're 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 finding for us. What does not for profit mean? Because I guess it means you don't pay tax on profits. Not for but profit. But you don't make profits, I guess. Yeah, so not for profit basically means we can't make money. Yeah. Um, which basically, what it does is it closes one door and opens another. So the, it closes the door to getting investors. Because, and, and just a sidebar, if we want to start a rant about impact investing, I think impact investing is bullshit. Because impact investing is still trying to get above 0% returns, right? I think if impact investing was up to minus 50% returns, then I would believe it. But... As long as we want positive returns, you can't truly really be about it. Yeah. So Just we're closing the door to investors. Um, but what we're doing is we're opening two doors um, on the other side. Uh, one is donations. So people who want to be generous with their money. Um, we'll come so back to that because hopefully there's a few generous potential donors that listening. It would yeah. be wonderful. And then the other is actually to partnerships. And yep. so when we were for profit, we tried to do some partnerships and, you know, there's Instagram influencers who do content about well-being. We reached out to a few and they said, yeah, that's great. We'll promote Live Better. It's $15,000 or $20,000. And and it, they cannot, we ended up in the same problem that we couldn't afford to sponsor this Instagram influencer for $20,000 because we were going to make enough money on the other end. And now we're not legally a non, full nonprofit yet, hopefully by end of year. Um, but basically what we're already seeing is we're now opening a different set of conversations. We're saying, hey, we're not for profit. We have an app. Um, as soon as we have a research study, we can say research proves that this helps. Can you please help promote us to your audience? And you're helping them by doing this. And already it's clear we're, we've got a couple things line, lining up that will let us really get a much the reach we want to help people um, without having to spend millions of dollars in marketing. So so and, and I think that given that the investor model wasn't going to work anyways without going corporate, I think we can now make through, you know, we have some, some plans for from building a small revenue stream plus Plus, if we can get some donations from foundations and potentially direct donations from our customers, I think we can build a stable uh, company that can offer the service for free. So this way we don't abandon the people who need it most. And, and, and I think for mental health, it's particularly important because if you look at the, the, the populations that are suffering the most and suicide statistics are, are one of the most gruesome ways to look at it, but really quite indicative that, you know, you look at it, poor communities, see suicide rates going up far, far higher than rich ones. So in Manhattan, suicide is up something like 50% over the last 10 years. In backwater Tennessee, it's up 1,000%. So, and, and, that's, and those people don't have money, right? So I think if we, if we say that all this new technology for mental health is only for people who have money, we're just making the inequality problem, which is calling all of our, causing so many populist problems around the world today, worse. And so we wanna make sure that we are accessible to everybody. Um, just it's the social right thing to do. Fantastic. And if somebody wanted to donate, like they just they just go into the app and there's it's clear how to there, donate. There is in the app. If you can install the app, we we, we added this uh, actually just last week. So I don't have the stats yet, but you can become a patron. It's a little better in the app. But really, we, you know, we're looking for a few uh, other foundations or high net worth individuals who are willing to make a long term commitment who will help us fund us for two or three years at a time. Um, so that we can get the right team on board because really we need you know, a company like the reality of an internet startup is you need something like 500, 200, 500,000 to a million a year to have a proper team yep. uh, in the sense that, you know, if you need someone to do the engineering and marketing, customer support, social media, uh, finance, management, it adds up. And how long, how long will you keep this going yourself if you don't find those donors and you don't find those foundations and... And people don't, you know, and you aren't able to charge for any services. Like, wh wh how long will you do this? At least through 2020. Cool. I think this is probably the, the time to, to wrap it up. But I just want I think I wanted to finish by just saying that, you know, you, we spent a lot of this podcast talking about kind of macro issues that you, neither you nor I really feel like we know how to solve. Plus, we spent a lot of time sort of saying that, startups can be a vehicle for good but you know a qualified vehicle for good but yet i strongly get the impression from you that even though you might not know precisely how to fix these macro problems you're using a startup to fix them 
bottom up bit by bit. So in, in some ways, I feel like you're, you know, you're a, you're a, you're a contradiction because, um, because I think you are solving these massive societal problems. Maybe not in one go, but and I think you're using tech and a startup to do it. And and one thing I ask myself every day, which I think is the important question, is is it the right vehicle? Yep. And, and I'll give you an example. One thought that troubles me, I read this book, Winner Takes All, yep. uh, Winners Take All, recently. Wonderful book, very thought-provoking. Very good book. What's with the link? Yeah. yeah. And and he, he makes the point that often what we do as startups is just a drop in the bucket. And uh, this made me think about something. You know, I'm spending my time trying to build tools to help people boost their mental health. But, you know, in Switzerland and in the U.S., uh, mental health care is not reimbursed very well by insurance. And if we could just get mental health care to be fully reimbursed, wouldn't we have a far more significant impact? Because let's be realistic, my app is nowhere near as good as going to visit a therapist. And so if we can just get therapy to be reimbursed or to have more social workers to do more kind of real in-person sessions, which will have a bigger impact. So should I perhaps shift my energy towards lobbying I think that's the key question. If you so, want to feel better, I don't believe those two things are mutually exclusive, right? Because because I believe that with your app, by making mental health more accessible to people, you're you're already starting to create. I don't want to say groundswell because I don't know how many people use it, but like you're already starting for society to appreciate that this can help and maybe create some pressure for that for it to be made more widely available. Yeah, I hope so. I hope yeah, so. I, I hope so I, too. Yeah, and I, I think that's why. What we to your point, we probably need both. Yeah. Um, but I think very few people are doing the latter. Very p- and, and I think that's the point of winner takes all is that we're all spending time on these things because they're so close. You know, we, it's the social acceptable thing is to do the startup, which I'm doing. But perhaps we need to start lobbying more or get into politics. Or, you know, I can't run for government here anyways, and I would be a terrible politician. But I think that's, that's the question that keeps nagging at me. Well, again, to finish on a positive note is pay <laughs> a compliment because I guess compliments also boost uh, well-being. The other point in that book, uh, one of the many other points in that book, which again, we, we here at Aperture Hall would highly recommend, is that there's a lot of like self-serving philanthropy. And I, and I think where you're different is you're somebody who um, came out of Silicon Valley, I, I, I guess you, you, did, you did well through AppNexus, and you're being a true philanthropist, because this is a true exercise in philanthropy in a way that going to Davos each year, for example, isn't, right? I guess. Thank you. <laughs> I'll say thank you for the, it's a nice compliment. It's, it's, and I can tell you the most pleasure I get every day is trying, trying to help um, and seeing when people write us thank you notes. It's, it's, it's the thing that makes my day. Um, so I like what I do and I rec- recommend others do the same. Can't think of a better way to finish than that, which is, I mean, you, you yourself are, eating your dog food, right? You accept that happiness is the ultimate goal in life and you're doing stuff to promote your own happiness, right? Even through the pursuit of helping others, as it turns out. It's totally selfish. Yeah, yeah it's like selfless self- selfless selfishness. Yeah. Yes, and now my head hurts. <laughs> yeah. Well, good for you for, 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 for pursuing it. Okay, so um, Mike, thank you. you sh- I guess you should thank me. <laughs> I thank you again for having yeah. me. Well, thank you very much for making the trip to Geneva for this podcast. And um, again, we'll tweet out the links to some of your blogs. We'll tweet out the links to some of the books we mentioned. And we'll also tweet out a link to the app. And if anybody wants to make a donation, please do. It's a very good cause. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much.